One of the most um, important themes in the Bible is that of stewardship. And uh, when preachers preach about stewardship, usually uh, they hit um, that theme, uh, usually at the beginning of the year, when budgets are being formed and plans are drawn for the work of the church in the upcoming year. So, you know, uh, uh, it's time for a lesson on stewardship, you know, in the cycle of preaching, preachers know this, uh, this kind of routine of uh, various lessons and themes throughout the year. So stewardship, you know, near the beginning of the year when we're going to uh, plan our giving, so on and so forth. And usually that sermon talks about good stewardship and it describes the idea of stewardship in the terms of, of our offering uh, at church, you know, how much we give and when we give and why we give and the attitude, you know, it was interesting that uh, uh, Mike Coghill mentioned some of that in his uh, remarks uh, during the communion and he and I also do not talk about what sermons is going to get uh, preached, so it's interesting that he mentioned that. And of course all this is good and biblical, uh, but I believe that um, it might be uh, too narrow an approach to the topic of stewardship. Stewardship is, is the broad heading and giving at church is a kind of a subheading under that. Basically stewardship is the management of what God has given us to His glory and to the edification of others you know, in the church as well as ourselves. You know, Adam for example, he was the steward of all that God gave him and was taught to return a portion uh, to God. Uh, he managed everything, uh, and the giving of the first portion was only part of the stewardship, not the whole of it. See the idea I'm trying to get across here? Stewardship is not just about giving, it's also about management. In other words, there's more to stewardship than what we, we just put in the plate on, on Sunday morning. You could say that if we learned how to be good stewards in the general sense, it would guide us in the specific area of giving to the Lord in the assembly. And so this morning I want to study a parable that provides us with some general principles that Jesus taught concerning good stewardship. So first of all, we're going to study the parable itself and then try to draw some you know, some lessons that it might teach. So if you do have your Bibles, Ryan read out of Matthew 25, that's where we're going to be, be a textual lesson. Matthew chapter 25, pretty much where we're going to stay. And this is the parable of the talents. And so the first section, I'm going to read again now that you're familiar with it. So the master entrusts his possessions. So in Matthew chapter 25, 14 and 15 it says, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, one. And he went on his journey. So what's happening here is that the, the master promotes these servants to the point of stewardship. You see, slaves, they just carried out tasks. But these servants were given a special responsibility by having control over the wealth of the master. So they weren't just slaves, they were stewards. See the difference? Now a talent, mentioned here, was a measure, about 6,000 denarii worth, uh, today about a several thousand dollars, well actually then it was worth seven th several thousands of dollars, you know, like a small fortune. Okay? So it wasn't just a little spending money, he leaves each of them a small fortune. Note that each of them received a sizable amount, although a different amount, and each according to his ability. So each had enough to work with, but not beyond his ability to manage. All right, so now we see the, the servant's response in the next couple of verses, verse 16. It says, immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. 
So what's the, what's the servant's response? Well, the first one, it says, immediately, without delay, began to work. Obviously, ready for the challenge, ready for the responsibility. Interesting, the Greek word here, trade, means to labor or work at something, not trade like you know, stock trading, you know, not that kind of trading. I mean, he began to, to work. Uh, and so he accomplishes 100% on uh, the investment. The second one does exactly the same thing in the same manner and with similar results. The third one, it says, went aside. Interesting that verb suggests a lack of direction, a lack of purposefulness. And so he hides the money according to Eastern custom of the time. They didn't have safes or things like that, so they dug holes in the ground and they, they hid things in the ground. And so in the next couple of verses, we have the settling of accounts. So we begin in verse 19, it says, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So the master returns. The master returns to see what they have done in order to punish or to reward. Remember at the beginning it says he entrusted. And so he was going to come back and there was going to be a reckoning because he entrusted something. So there was going to be a judgment on that. He didn't just give it away. And so we see the first servant's report, verse 20. It says, the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. So the first servant brings forth the original investment and the, the profit. And the master responds to him with approval and reward. It says in verse 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So the master responds with approval and reward. Approval his personal confirmation of his ability and his success and his faithfulness. Yes, you, you are all these things. And reward, what is the reward? Well, he was a slave and he got to be a steward, now he's moving up. More responsibility, a better position. So he demonstrates his faithfulness in little things. Now he's going to be entrusted with greater things. You know, it's interesting to note that in the parable, Vast sums of money, remember I said it was like a small fortune, vast sums of money are considered as few things by the master, suggesting the great wealth and generosity of this master. And so we move to the second servant, verse 22. Also the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've gained two more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So similar situation, same report. Approval and reward is the same, but in proportion to his ability to benefit from it and to do it well. You know, God does not bless us beyond our ability and our capacity to handle it. You know, he does not lead us into temptation. You know, we always say, well, you know, whatever happens, the Lord won't put on us more than we can handle. But we always talk about that in terms of trouble. But the opposite is true as well. He doesn't give us so many blessings you know, so that we're going to lose ourselves. Must be why I'm not rich. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's why we're all not rich. Because He knows how much we can handle of both trouble and blessings. And then we get to the, to the third servant's report, verse 24. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. So this servant has a lot of cheek he begins by making an excuse for his failure and blames his failure on his master. And so he says to his master, you, I knew you to be hard, and the word here means inhuman, over-demanding, and this is usually a term of reproach. 
And then he says, you know, you, you, know, you reap, uh, you, you, you gather where you didn't reap, or you reap where you didn't sow, and so on and so forth. Says the same thing, you know, that you're a hard person, but he just says it in a different way. A man who earns a living from the hard work of other, on the backs of other people. You see what I'm saying? You're a slave driver, basically. I, since I knew you were a heartless slave driver, this is how he opens up. So fearing a hard master who lives off his servants, he says, I, I held on to your money so I could be sure you received something when you returned. So his argument was that if he lost the money, his master, being totally without sympathy, would punish him. So he played it safe. And so we get to the master's response to this particular servant, verse 26. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. So he doesn't answer the accusation made about him. He doesn't say, what do you mean? I'm not heartless, come on, I gave you, you know, he doesn't answer that. He assumes the servant's comments are accurate and he judges him based on these and adds his assessment of the servant's character. First he says, you're wicked, actively evil. It's sometimes a same word used to describe Satan, the, the, uh, the malignant one. He says, you know, I may be a slave master, but here's what you are. You're wicked, you're lazy, he said. Not just a slow poke or slothful, but you're irritating. The type you know, that never does anything but manages to create trouble. Do you ever have one of those people that you work with? And it implies the idea that he's foolish. If what he said about his master was true, well the wisest thing to do was to bank the money at interest. You should have let the bankers do the work for me if you were not going to. And so he judges this servant like the others. In verse 28 he says, therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. You know, he loses his talent, right? In other words, the responsibility, the opportunity, the blessings that go with it. And he sees his talent given to the one who's got 10. And you know what? We, we have trouble with this particular verse because it doesn't seem fair. This guy's got 10 over here, this guy loses the one that he has, and you know, if it was us, you know, I'd say, well, 10, well, I'm going to take five and give it to this guy, and then five and give it to the other guy. But to take all 10 and give it to the guy who's already got 10, you know, that, that doesn't square with our you know, American sense of fairness and, and, and justice. So there's an explanation for this action in verse 29. Jesus says, for to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance, but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. What's really happening here is the principle of you know, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. In society, we try to relieve the plight of the poor, and this is right, and it's according to the Bible, and of course it's according to God's principles. You know, we are our brother's keepers. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. But Jesus here in this parable here, He's not laying down a principle for social justice in this parable. In this parable, He's explaining how things work in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, there's a difference. A parable is a story using earthly characters and situations to reveal and to explain the workings of the unseen world. In this case, the workings of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So the fact that the servant with the most talent gets even more wealth, you know, as I say, it doesn't square with our idea of justice. It's, and, and you know what? It's not meant to. It's meant to show that in the kingdom, those who are rich in Christ grow richer at an ever increasing rate. And those who are poor in Christ because of wickedness and laziness become poorer at an ever increasing rate. That's what's being taught here. For example, those who, I'll pick a simple example that all of us can relate to. We might not all like it, 
but I think we can all relate to it. Take, for example, those who attend services on a regular basis, okay? They're there Sunday morning, Bible class, they come to worship, they come in the evening, they come on Wednesday night, so on and so forth. What happens to those people? Well, after you know, 36 years in ministry, I can tell you what happens to those people. They grow in spiritual knowledge. They grow in wisdom and patience and joy and love and peace and the ability to live successful Christian lives. Because why? Because they, they feed on God's word continually. Because they enjoy the fellowship of the saints continually. Because they are exhorted continually. Because they're admonished continually. Because they're taught continually. Because they're encouraged continually, continually. It never stops. They're in the presence of the word. They're in the circle of the spirit continually. On the other hand, those who are unfaithful, sporadic, what happens to them? I can say again, not surveys or anything, I can tell you from just observing the church, working with people for three plus decades, I can tell you what happens. Well, they just get weaker. They get weaker and weaker. They become bored with religion. They become more muddled in sinfulness and the world until they have no strength left to believe and many times fall away. The ones who are extremely faithful, their blessings don't just add up, they multiply. There is a quantum leap in their growth. And those who are unfaithful suffer the exact opposite faith, uh, fate. So in verse 30, Jesus says here in the parable, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So final judgment of the third servant sees him outside the master's house, which is equivalent to the suffering and the damnation caused to those who are unfaithful. So, so we see this servant revealed for what he is. He loses his position, he's punished by separation from his master. He, uh, uh, all of this contains all the elements of our own judgment as stewards when it comes. Because when the judgment comes, there will be a revelation of what we are, faithful or unfaithful. And there will be a transformation of our position, glorified with Christ or separated from Christ. I mean, if what we practice is being away from Christ, is being away from the church, is being away from God's people, is being away from God's word, is being away from God's service, is being away from the influence of the whole, if that's what we practice, how do we ever think that we're going to end up with being in the circle of the saved? How do we get to there? How, how does that work? You know, thanks to my buddy Ron, I've really enjoyed you know, learning how to play golf, right? But I've also learned another important thing. I'm not very good. You know, it was like, a, it was like a, an aha moment, you know? <laughs> so I'm playing away and I'm playing away and it's going on almost two years now. And I said to myself, why is it my ball here? Why is it I miss? Because in my head I'm great. I, I'm, I'm great in my head. And then like a thunderbolt, like the heavens opened, like the Spirit spoke to me and said, you're just not very good. <laughs> and I said, why Lord? Because you play once a week. <laughs> you, can't good, you can't get good at anything unless you work at it. Here's my point. How in heaven's name, how in heaven's name, can we think that we can get any good at, Christ, at Christianity when we don't practice it? Imagine how bad I would be if I only played golf once a month or once every two months. Now I'm not saying that coming to church you know, is the be all of everything. Of course not. 
but it, 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 it's a barometer. You want to find out what the temperature is in your house, you go to the thermostat and you kind of look, you know, oh, 76. You know, it might be 74 in the back bedroom you know, where it's shadier, and it might be 78 in the front room you know, where the sun is, you know, but it's around 76. Well, it's the same thing with Christianity. You take a look at that thermometer there. Involvement, worship, service, giving, you, know, you take a look at that and it tells you the temperature of your Christianity. So I said at the beginning that this parable teaches us that one facet of God's judgment upon His people will be based on how they manage the talents that they have been given. And this parable gives us instruction about good and bad stewardship. We've seen some bad stewardship with this third servant and I've talked about that so let's see what, you know, if we can draw some lessons on good stewardship from this parable, because I don't want us to leave here thinking, man, the preacher beat us up today, and you know, I should have stayed in bed. I want us to go away with some good ideas as well, something encouraging. So some positive lessons from this about stewardship. So you want good stewardship? What does it involve? Number one, good stewardship involves risk. You need to understand that good stewardship isn't just hoarding and counting resources. Some people see stewardship as accounting principles. You know, make sure we have all the, let's make sure we have all the receipts from the youth rally, because we want to be good stewards. Well, yeah, yeah. But good stewardship is doing something constructive with what you have, not just counting what you have. Servants, these servants in the parable, they had to work. They had to risk losing talents in order to make a profit. It involves wise investment in the work of the Lord. Think for a second. All the resources belong to Him, the Lord, and He has lots of resources. And He wants profit, not just balanced books, not just everything accounted for. In the parable, the safe investment in the bank, notice, it was the least one could do, not the most. So we need to understand that there is no faith without risk. And our master has assured us that he will not let us fall when we're out on a limb for him. We need to worry about souls, not about money. We need to invest our emotional energy in helping people find Jesus Christ, not arguing you know, who controls the purse. Remember that in the New Testament, the only person who expressed worry over money was Judas, not Jesus. Principle number two, good stewardship involves risk. It also involves excellence. As stewards of God's talents and blessings, we need to be aware of the fact that whatever we do, we must do it well. From the most insignificant thing to the most important thing. We do it well. Jesus takes great pains to repeat the idea that personal and corporate growth in the kingdom involves the learning of accountability and excellence in small matters before being invested with large matters. If we're asked to come up and read, have we even read what we're going to read before we get up to read it? Are we ready? Are we looking the part? You know? Excellence in the smallest matters because everything we do is for God. People in the church don't always see or have the ability to judge and certainly we have no power to reward people in the church for what has been done. But God, He does see and He can judge and He will reward and He will punish based on the stewardship of the talents that He has given us. Whatever we do, let's do it right the first time. I remember when the expansion of this building took place, it was the last big construction job that we had here. I mean, excellence, every little thing was thought through. You know, I can't say enough about Dave Roberts, who kind of head-manned this project. 
Everything was thought through. It had to be perfect. All the cabinetry, we didn't go to Office Depot and buy the cheapest junk. No offense, Office Depot people watching. You know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't do that. Everything was done at uh, Bruce's shop. And Bruce and Dave, all of, the, all of the cabinetry, all of the woodwork, everything made by hand. The long, the hard way. The excellent way. Do it right the first time. Don't cheap out. Be the best and do the best for the master. And so good stewardship, risk, excellence, and good stewardship involves hard work. Hard work. You know, making suggestions and making complaints, this isn't stewardship. Carrying out the tasks and solving the problems, that's stewardship. Fixing the things you know, that cause the complaints, that's what stewardship is. Worrying about money, this is not stewardship. It's a sign of lack of faith. It's a sign that we've got our eyes on this world and not the next. Giving significantly and regularly, that's stewardship, and that's where the idea of giving comes in, right there. Is our giving excellent? You know, I heard a preacher say once, it was a, almost a childish example, but so true. He says, if Jesus was sitting in the pew next to you, you know, you're in the pew and next the Lord and it came time for the offering, would you change the number on the check? Fitting some of the church's activities into your lifestyle, that's not stewardship. Making the Lord and His church the basis and then building your life around Him and His church, that's good and I might add wise Stewardship. You want to succeed as an adult? You want to succeed in your marriage? You want to succeed as a parent? You want to succeed as a senior, a grandparent? You want to succeed spiritually? You cannot do it without the church. You, you can't do it without the church. If there's one thing I have learned is I have seen people who tried to do that and without exception have failed. Good stewardship requires the risk of faith, the commitment to excellence, and old-fashioned hard work, but the reward is worth it because good stewards grow richer and richer in the spiritual blessings of Christ each day they live. And if you've tasted those blessings, you know exactly what I'm saying. The joy of hearing the shout and the noise of the angel and the trumpet of God and know that the call will be for you to be with Him forever in the heavens when He comes in His glory. This is the reward worth working towards, worth waiting for, worth being excellent for, worth risking for. So when it comes to stewardship, the question isn't just, am I giving enough? Or how much should I you know, increase my giving? These questions are, they're just too small. They don't address the entire issue. A better question is this, am I a good steward? Because if the answer is yes, this business of giving to the church is usually well in hand, as is the management of all other things that God has blessed you with. And do you know how to answer that question? You know, am I a good steward? Not simply by counting how much money you put in the plate. No, you answer that question by examining how anxious you are for the return of Jesus. That's how you answer that question. Am I a good steward? Well, how anxious are you for the return of Jesus? I've noticed that good stewards are not only ready, but anxious for the return of their master. From righteous Abel to the beloved John, those who served with zeal and faith saw the coming of the Lord as a great day, a happy and a blessed day. A little bit like children who have a good report card. Kids who get a good report card, they come home, where's dad, is dad home yet? 
No, he had to stop off at the, you know, the garage on the way home. Oh, why, why? What's, I got my report card. When's he coming home? Why? Because I got all A's. I want dad to see my report card. Again, childish, right? We can all relate to it as children, as parents, as grandparents, right? But you know what? I can't wait till the master comes. Why? I have fruit. I got stuff. I took a risk. I got scars. I got beat up for him. I was persecuted for him. I lost money for him. I lived below my level because of my faith. I can't wait till he gets here. And then those who had nothing but excuses for sloppy work, slovenly attitudes, sinful habits, they dread the day of his coming. Why? They got nothing to look forward to because they've got nothing to bring forward. So I ask you again, are you a good steward? Are you ready? Are you anxious for the master's return? And you are ready if you have confessed His name and repented of your sins, of course. You've been immersed or baptized in order to receive forgiveness for those sins and the indwelling of the Spirit. That's, that, that makes you ready. And you become anxious for His return as the quality and the quantity of what you have to give to the Lord in every area of your life increases. See, it's not just being ready, it's being anxious. So if you're not ready, then come this morning and prepare yourself for His return by being baptized in His name. And if you're not anxious, then decide this very morning to rededicate your life and all that it encompasses to His service. If the Lord is inviting you to go from slave to trusted steward, then come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.